So again, thank you ladies so much for joining us and thank you for those of you that are tuning in to watch this today with us. Um, my name is Melissa Rostad. I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. And I am joined today by a truly wonderful panel that I'm super excited about. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Judy Hurst, who is one of the museum's um, board of directors, introduce our two wonderful panelists today. And uh, just a reminder, programs like this are free. Um, Barbara and Linda have generously donated their time to us today. So if you would like to make a donation to support the museum so that we can conti continue doing programs like this, we'd greatly appreciate it. For those of you that aren't familiar with the museum, we are located in Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee, about 30 minutes north of Milwaukee. Um, so we hope you can come out and see us at some point. Um, and with that, I will actually turn things over to Judy and we can really get things started. Um, a quick few things. We are live streaming this to Facebook. We are monitoring Facebook. So if you are watching it that way and have questions, go ahead and type your questions right in there. We have somebody monitoring that um, who will be able to ask the panelists the questions. For those of you that are on Zoom and joining us, click in the chat if you have any questions and we'll make sure that the panelists get a chance to um, answer those as well. And with that, Judy, if you want to take it from there. Excellent. Well, thank you, Melissa. I am so thrilled and honored today to be able to introduce our uh, very acclaimed and renowned master Navajo weavers, Barbara Teller Ornalis. Did I pronounce that right, Barbara? Yes, you did. <laughs> and her sister, Linda Teller Pete. And we have Linda's husband, Belvin with us in the background. And um, they are so special and unique. They are fifth, both of you are fifth generation weavers uh, from a family in, originally from the uh, Two Gray Hills area of New Mexico, correct? Mm -hmm. That's and correct. They are authors. They'll speak more about uh, their books. Um, but the amazing thing to me is their generosity in sharing uh, their life's work in being master weavers and uh, carrying on the important traditions of Diné, did I pronounce that right as well? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, Navajo weaving. And um, it's just a complete honor that I was able to connect with the two of you and that you are sharing with our audience today and those that are going to watch it in the future. Uh, <laughs> your life's work is um, being shared and that's something very unique as well. And uh, that makes the two of you extra special. And I'm going to turn the program over to Barbara and Linda. Thank you so much, both of you. Great. Good, good morning, everyone, or afternoon. I don't know where everybody's at, but I'm in Denver, Colorado. I am Linda Teller-Pete, and we're going to run um, uh, a PowerPoint, but we're really not going to stick to, um, you know, the, the, the normal um, things. We're, we're going to just run through some, some slides. And those of you that are typing out questions, if you want to revisit some of the slides, I understand that this will be saved onto Facebook or the museum's homepage. And if in the future you want to ask us some questions, um, you, you can get a hold of us. I think, um, I, I think our email addresses are, are also on the slides as well. Um, but I am in Denver and Barbara is in Tucson. Yeah. Hi, I'm Barbara Teller Ornelas. I, I'm coming to you guys in Tucson. And thank you to everyone for tuning in and listening to us and tell our stories. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, share my screen and I'm going to run the PowerPoint. Oops. It worked so well before. <laughs> there you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Yeah, she Barbara Teller Ornelas in she 
We're, um, I'm Barbara Teller Ornells, my sister Linda. We're of the Edgewater people born for water that flows together. And our, um, our grandfather's clans are one who walks around and Red Bottoms clan. And this is who we are. And we're fifth generation weavers from Tugra Hill, New Mexico. Okay, so in our family currently, um, uh, Barbara is is our um, main um, weaver that kind of holds our whole family together. And um, um, I followed in her footsteps not too long ago um, because I had taken a different path. But uh, uh, our mom and our grandmothers, everybody made sure that we remained uh, weavers no matter where we were. Uh, what kind of career that we went into. Um, right now we have about seven generations uh, in our family um, that uh, have been weavers. And we think that probably there were more than seven generations, but, and only because our way of uh, recording history is all oral. And uh, there's been a lot of lost um, um, information only because of the things that happened to the Navajo people. And I'll get into that uh, further down in our, um, in our presentation. So our first generation that has been recorded is our um, uh, great, great grandmother, Asantka Bahia. She was um, the first documented weaver in, in our families uh, from Newcomb, New Mexico. Newcomb, New Mexico is right by uh, the Four Corners area. It's between Gallup, New Mexico and uh, Shiprock, New Mexico. We're sort of right in the middle off the, the Highway 491. And uh, that's where Barbara and I grew up half the time. And then the other half the time, we grew up up at the Two Great Hills Trading Post where our father was a, 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 a trader for 35 years. And, um, and um, he dealt with um, buying and selling rugs. So Barbara and I have been around the market as well uh, as we grew up. And um, uh, we are lucky that our mother was such a, uh, uh, a camera bug that she took a lot of photos of her mother and her grandmother. And this is one of the photos that we have um, the, the lady that is on uh, the, the left side is our grandmother, Susie Tom, and the lady on the right side is her mother, our great grandmother, Jeanette Sui Bitsit. And the rug that you see behind them is, uh, uh, is a collaboration piece that they did, and uh, it has color in it. And later on, we'll, I'll show you what the colors look like. But this was the evolution of two great, the Two Great Hills style when it first started. And I believe that this rug was probably woven in the 1940s maybe, or early 50s, I'm not really sure. Um, but that's a, a collaboration piece that the two women um, wove together. And our, our uh, paternal grandmother, Nellie Pashlika Keller, is a photograph, um, but I'll, I'll talk about her later on after our, our grandmother, Susie Tom. Um, but our, our, our maternal grandmother was Susie Tom, and she did the Two Great Hills style, and she was very prolific um, in her weaving style. And she had to because she had two separate families. The first family that she had was our mother and our, our aunt, uh, our, uh, our aunt Margaret Yazi. And, uh, and she lost her first husband, so she had to get remarried. And uh, when she got remarried, she asked her mother to arrange for a marriage that included a bigger land-based and cheap because she was a weaver and she wanted the, the, uh, the flock for her, uh, she wanted the wool for her weaving. And so uh, with the second family, and we have another set of uh, 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 children that came, that came with that family. And those are our aunts and uncles. And um, they still live in the area of Newcomb. And uh, 
uh, our aunt Mary Louise is still a weaver. She's like in her 80s and she's still a weaver. Um, and uh, our paternal grandmother, Nash Nellie Pashlik, I tell her, um, actually she was a weaver, but she had a different financial situation to where um, she really didn't have to weave to sell her, her rugs to make a living. She actually uh, wove for, um, for functional pieces, a lot of saddle blankets, a lot of uh, um, it, it, clothing, you know, functional wear, that kind of stuff. But she was very well known for her, uh, her twills. And this is a sampler that Barbara has in her possession. Um, and you see all the different twill styles. And um, uh, this was our first teller catalog. Our dad used to work at the trading post and tourists would come in and they want a rug, but they're not sure what they want. So he would roll out this rug and say, okay, do you want a twill? Do you want a regular weaving? Um, the, 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 the pattern where we have the red zigzag is actually a two-face. So she has um, a different pattern on the other side. So this was a, a, a sampler that my dad would show to tourists. And my grandmother was really proud that uh, she also added to her wool collection from, um, uh, from a store where she bought the red heart, um, uh, you know, acrylic yarn. And so at the very bottom where you see that really bright red and blue, and green and yellow, that's red heart uh, acrylic wool. And uh, she wanted to, to let people know that she could weave with anything. So this is, this is a piece that we really treasure. Um, our father gave this to Barbara to, to keep for uh, prosperity. And so um, we, we really take care of it. And one of these days, I think Barbara and I want to sit down and kind of uh, figure out what all the twills are because uh, uh, Barbara's first weaving project was actually a twill. And then after that, our mother took over and made us into two gray hill weavers. So we weren't allowed to do twills. <laughs> um, but our fourth generation, it was our mom. We lost her in 2014. Um, but her two sisters, uh, Margaret Yazi, the lady in the middle, and the lady on the right is our uh, aunt Mary Louise, who still uh, weaves. You know, she's uh, 82 or something like that, and she's still weaving. Um, both of the women also used to own a big, uh, um, big flocks of sheep. And from there, they gathered all the wool that we needed for our weaving. And uh, we would all get together to, to figure out, you know, who would uh, get the most, which actually belonged to Barbara because she was the most prolific weaver. And uh, when our aunt um, would come over to our mom's house, they used to all work together. They would card, they would spin, um, you know, most of, most of the time, you know, Barbara and I learned a lot by observation. Um, but we also, as children, were given tasks that, that uh, uh, really involved the weaving as well. I mean, we, Barbara became the best spinner, um, and that's, you know, she, she really loves to do that. I really like to card, but nowadays we can't get uh, access to raw wool. So Barbara and I are now buying roving wool, and it's already been carded. So um, Barbara does the bulk of our spinning for our weaving projects. And she has to spin herself uh, for me, for her son, Michael, and for her daughter, uh, Sierra, and for our granddaughter, Roxanne. So all of us uh, use hand carded, hand spun. And um, uh, well, the hand carded, you know, there are some hand carded, but largely we, we depend on roving that uh, we buy from the mills. Uh, but Barbara uh, can spin very, very finely. And she, uh, we only weave with singles. We don't weave with um, uh, plied wool. And uh, she also, uh, the speaking that she does, I don't know if you could classify as lace weight or I don't know, it's one of those um, uh, terms that we're not very familiar with, like fingerling or lace or whatever, but Barbara is really good at, at uh, spinning very consistently and very fine. Um, and our mother is actually the one that Barbara and I learned how to weave from. She taught us the basics. Um, she taught us all of the 
uh, the warping um, uh, uh, that we needed to, to uh, get started with. And um, she was very uh, focused on documentation. And our mother always had a camera. She took photos of a lot of the weavers that came to the trade, take three photos. One photo for her to keep, one for the weaver, and one to go with the weaving. And uh, the traders back then would attach those photos to the weaving so that the whoever bought them would know um, who the weaver was. And so our mother amassed um, very large, large cans of uh, uh, coffee cans full of her uh, photographs. And even, I think in her mid seventies, you could take out a photo and ask her, mom, what, where did this come from and whose rug is it? And she was very sharp and she would know who that weaving belonged to. Um, sometimes she even gave us like surprising information as to how much the rug sold for, um, if it had problems, you know, and if they did, the, the trader would bring uh, those rugs into our mom's apartment um, in the back of the Two Gray Hills Trading Post, and she would fix all of the rugs. So Barbara and our older sister, Roseanne, really picked up those troubleshooting uh, skills from, from watching our mom do her thing. And, um, and as our mom aged, she uh, uh, could no longer really see that well, and uh, she, she had to give up weaving. So she really went to uh, a different forms of uh, fiber work, like she did quilting, she did uh, crocheting, whatever. And, um, um, and one of the things that we realized um, with our mom was that she grew up in a generation where she was told how to weave, when to weave, and what colors to weave with. And in Two Gray Hills, we are weaving with um, natural colors. But she remembers as a youth, her grandmother and her mom weaving with color. And by the time she got there, she was told that the trader that took over does not want uh, the, the, the colors in the Two Gray Hill weavings anymore. And she has always resented that. We didn't know that until she was 84 and she was telling us that, you know, she's always wanted to weave with color. And we had a, a Japanese uh, weaving student that came to our class that brought a little plastic um, uh, loom. If you can see that right there on the bottom photo, our mom's using that little plastic thing. And so we gave that to her and she found a new outlet, you know, she started weaving. And at the time, Barbara was her primary caretaker. And Barbara would have to tell her mom, mom, you need to stop, you need to eat something, you need to go to bed, you need to, you know, do, do, you need to take care of yourself. But all she wanted to do was weave. And she was fascinated with all these new colors. She got a, 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 a reminder for her dental appointment and it had a clock on it and she wanted to weave that pictorial and she did. And so it gave her, um, I mean, she took a 20 year hiatus between the last time that she wove her, her Navajo rugs. And then she started doing these little uh, commercial wool rugs. She amassed a lot of it. And so Barbara and I created a, a Facebook page for her to sell all those weavings. And she was really happy that she was able to get back to her weaving before she passed. And so we're very grateful for, um, for, for that to have happened in her life. And, um, uh, it, and the fifth generation includes my sister and me, Barbara, and uh, our older sister, Roseanne. Um, and we lost her in 1996, but uh, we regard her as the one who taught us the most knowledge of how we would weave. She was really big on quality control. She was really big on um, keeping us focused on color combinations, design construction. Um, I mean, she taught us so much more um, and the risks that she took herself to create these fine, fine tapestries. And she is always going to be regarded as one of the best weavers that have ever lived. And uh, you, you see her work like in galleries or, or um, 
uh, museums and we know immediately that she's the one who created it because we're very familiar with her designs and some of the designs we still do um, we still do our designs from our grandmothers and our mom you know those are designs that have been in our families for generation and one of the questions that we always get asks asked is what do those designs mean and some of the some of the Navajo weaving designs um, have universal meanings but not a whole lot uh, not a whole lot are um, uh, have meanings attached to them and they vary from family to family so you do have to ask um, you know if a family produce a, a rug you have to ask them what what does it mean to you because every weaver is going to have a story behind their their uh, their their masterpieces and um, after after Roseanne left us in 1996 um, we all kind of went into this really dark period where none of us were weaving until our mother called us home um, about a year later and distribute her uh, our sister's weaving tools to all of us and said we need to get back into weaving and uh, Barbara um, did a four-year artist in residency at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona and that's where her two kids actually grew up they were actually babies when Barbara was doing the uh, artisan res uh, uh, the residency program, and uh, Michael, you know, her son, learned how to walk at the museum, and uh, um, and Barbara also learned a lot of the different styles because we are from the Two Great Hills area, and that's the only type of weaving that we knew how to do. But there at the museum she was um, able to learn about the period pieces, about the, the pieces from other regions, and so that um, uh, she was able to give, a, uh, give us a lot of information about these different types of weaving. So she started doing that, and for her to uh, detour from doing exclusively to Grey Hills, it really bothered our mother and our aunts to where they had to meet with Barbara and say, uh, listen, we are, we are two Grey Hill weavers and that we can't, um, we can't go into other styles. And Barbara said, you know, I have a family to raise, I've got bills to pay, and if people want different types of drugs, I'm gonna do them. And so she was our trailblazer. She opened up a lot of doors she opened up so much uh, for us to learn and um, and she's still doing it to this day and one of the things that put her uh, her work and our sister's work on the map was this big rug so I'm going to have Barbara tell you about this okay <clears throat> I didn't think I was going to get the chance to talk no I'm kidding uh, so um, back in 1982, 83, um, we had, um, we, uh, weaving wasn't really selling anymore and my, our older sister Roseanne had finished a piece and we took it to the trading post at um, Shiprock and the guy go, told Roseanne that, you know, I can't really buy it because I already have a couple of your pieces in the vault and nobody's, you know, buying um, weavings anymore. And, uh, but he really liked my sister, so he went ahead and bought her rug anyways. And on the drive home, we were trying to talk about how we could bring, um, um, you know, how we could highlight weaving so people know that, that there are still Navajo weavers and that, that real beautiful weavings are still being done. And so we got to our mom's house and, and we're still discussing all this. And then my mom said, why don't you guys do a large piece, a really big piece? And I said, well, it's been done before. I, there's a lot of people um, who've done huge pieces. And then my mom says, yeah, but not in tapestry quality, not, not in the kind of style that we're, we were weaving. And so we put our heads together and we ended up shearing uh, five different um, uh, sheeps. And it took us nine months of wool preparation from carding to spinning to um, blending colors and, and, and putting everything together. It took us about a week to uh, warp the, the whole loom. And, you know, we warped it in my, our mom's living room. 
and because we were sitting so far apart, we were throwing the ball at each other <laughs> to get it to, you know, to, to, to get the ball, the, the warp um, back and forth to each other. And we had the best time laughing about that whole thing. Anyway, so it took us, the weaving itself stood on the loom for almost four years, but the actual weaving time was two and a half years. And we finished it in 1987. Um, and then one year we didn't work on it because my sister was mad at me the whole time. <laughs> and it was all her fault. I had nothing to do with it. So anyways, we, um, we finished it in 87 and I had been doing it at Santa Fe Indian Market at that time for about three, four years. And so I told my sister, we should take it over there and see, you know, see how it does, you know, because, you know, at, at the time and even to this day, I, I truly believe that all the most of the top artists in every different native art field um, show there, you know, and so you're competing against the best of the best. And so we took the rug, we took the weaving over there and we showed them, and um, you know, we entered it in judging and um, 28 out of, um, 26 out of 28 judges voted for our piece uh, as best show. And it was the first time a textile had ever won the best of show. And the first time in 15 years that a traditional art had won. And the coolest thing about the, that whole weekend was walking in the Santa Fe Plaza uh, with the piece and you see all these um, Navajo artists coming out of their booth and they're like, I'm so proud to be Navajo today, you know? And because the piece was so big and so amazing and that, it made such a big splash and it, it was in all the newspapers. It was, we were on every movie, um, TV channels that you could think of when we were even, we even got interviewed on CNN. And, um, but the coolest thing was the morning of, of the, the show, um, this woman came up to me and she said, I, be, I spent the night here in your booth, you know, and that has never happened to me before. I know that, there's a lot of famous artists, you know, and they, they have all these millionaires sleeping in front of their booths, like, you know, homeless people. And so the, for somebody to say, I slept in your booth, that was pretty amazing to me. Anyways, so I, I took up what my mom used to do, you know, I took up a camera and I took photos of this piece uh, from start to finish. You know, I took pictures of the sheep and I, you know, the carding, the spinning and the weaving. And, and every time we did, you know, an inch or have um, a, a foot and, you know, uh, I would take a photo of it and I would, um, yeah, I put it all in the book and, and how we finished it and everything. And I handed it to her and I told her, this is, you know, the, the, um, the story of the book. And she looked at it and then she just was crying and she goes, I don't care what you want for this piece. I want it, you know? And so, my sister and I had been talking about the price on this piece and we had, to, we had mentioned it to a couple of traders and we said, we're, we're going to ask 60,000 for this piece. And the trader was like, you can never get that. That's impossible, you know? And so I put on a brave front and I told her, this is how much we want for this piece. And I expected her to say, thank you. Here's your book back and walk away, you know, but she didn't. So, her husband came up behind her and he goes, how do you want it? Cash, check, you know, like credit card. And, you know, and it was the most amazing time, you know, and it really put my sister and I as career, as weavers on the map, but it also brought a lot of highlight back to Navajo weaving because after this piece was on every newspaper and magazine and, and TV channels, um, people started remembering that there's Navajo weaving out there and they started coming around again, you know, and then I talked to a lot of traders and they always say, yeah, back in the, uh, you know, in the winter of 87, there was a big boom about um, people buying Navajo weavings again. And I'm like, yep, that's what I wanted to accomplish in my life. And I think I did that. Great. Okay. All right. So Barbara also was known um, to create the, uh, the the earlier weavings of the Navajo people the first phase second phase third phase and she would do them as sets and so that's the 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 picture that's next to the big rug that's one of her sampling of her sets of the uh, period pieces 
but she also did um, you know, she's no slouch because in, in um, 1990, she won Best of Show again um, at Santa Fe Indian Market all by herself. And, uh, and this is the, the weaving on the left side is the one that was the winner. Um, and she still does period pieces. She even got into doing some diverse arts and she did the Navajo Barbies, did all their clothes the mantas, the dresses. She redid their moccasins, redid their hair, um, put them on the uh, serape that she wove, and it really made a splash. So Barbara is continuing to, to knock down a lot of the uh, um, uh, things that seem traditional, and she is really getting into abstract stuff um, but remaining true to all the techniques that we have learned from our mother, our grandmothers, and our, uh, and our older sister. And so as when Barbara reached, uh, uh, started making um, uh, tapestries beyond the two gray hill styles, she really, got, um, um, she really got recognized for the different styles that she was doing. And um, you know, she has a lot of collectors that, that uh, ask for pieces unknown. She just kind of comes up with it and uh, mails it to them and they're exact, and it's exactly what they wanted. So she's, she's really been um, uh, a good role model for all of us. And we're thankful that she has broken down all these doors and really made it easier for me to follow uh, along because I grew up weaving as well. Barbara and I, when we grew up, um, our father made a loom. Um, if you see the, the picture on the uh, right is me sitting at a small loom, but our father made these gigantic looms for us. And Barbara and I sat face to face every day when we had to weave. And, um, you know, and as sisters, you don't always get along um, uh, all the time. And so when we sat facing each other, I would torture her by taking my battens and sticking it through the warps and trying to poke her. And then of course, you know, we, we would start uh, bickering and, and um, uh, doing, you know, all kinds of stuff. And my mom would come in and she would put a sheet between us to separate us so that we wouldn't look at each other. But I would still take my batten and I would stick it through the, the warp trying to see if I could poke her. And uh, and that's how we grew up. I mean, we, we had a lot of fun. Um, we, um, um, but when I uh, finished college, uh, my mom wove to put me through college and I wove as well for expenses. Uh, but once I got my degree, I made the announcement to my family that I have a degree, I'm gonna get a job, weaving's too hard. I don't, I don't like the marketing part. I like to weave, but I just don't like the marketing part. And so, um, you know, it took me a long time to come back. And when we lost our sister in 96 is really when I came back. Um, but I kind of take a different approach to where I really like to study the history part. And, um, uh, you know, Barbara is really good at documenting her stories on the pieces that she does. And so uh, coupled with what, with what I learned from her and from the research, um, all of our weavings have stories and uh, we can pick up a weaving that we've done, you know, 15 years ago and we can tell you exactly what was happening to us in that time frame. Um, and, and they're, they're wonderful uh, uh, reminders of what we have gone through. And so I still, I also branched out into different styles, um, child's blankets, mokis, that kind of stuff. Um, and, um, and I kind of led into um, the, the, the books as well, but we're gonna talk about that more um, uh, towards the end of this presentation. Um, Barbara's gonna talk about the sixth uh, generation, which are her kids. Mm -hmm. This is um, my daughter, Sierra Najona Teller Ornalis, and my son, Michael Paul Teller Ornalis. Um, they are four years apart. You know, I started uh, teaching Sierra when she was about four or five years old. Um, just and my mom set her up a little loom just so she could play with it and she she was doing okay you know but she she tended to um, fight in it you know and she she was very headstrong and 
and, and teaching her was um, amazing and frustrating at the same time. <laughs> and, um, you know, so years go by and my son was 11 years old and he came over to me and he said, um, are you ever going to teach me how to weave, you know? And I never really thought about teaching him, but he wanted to learn, you know? So I, um, I, you know, set up a loom for him and I started teaching him how to weave and stuff. And I remember as a child, um, um, living with my grandmother in White Rock, um, New Mexico. And, and she used to tell me that you, you were born a weaver. You know, you, you, you were born to do this. This is your gift. You know, you got, you got blessed by the weaving gods. And I never really understood what that meant. You know, I just like, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, I'm going to be something else, but I, I don't want to be a weaver, you know, because I always associated weaving with old people. Yeah. And, and you, know, you never see young people weaving, you know, so I just didn't want to get old right away, you know. So when my son asked me to do this, I started teaching him and I w watched him and I would tell him to do this, do that, you know, and he would just get it right away, you know, and, and it was like there was no explanation or like he already knew what I was going to tell him. And that's when I really understood what my grandmother was telling me, that you were born to do this. You were born to be a weaver and that you were blessed by the weaving gods. And I truly believe that my son also has that gift, you know, and my daughter has the gift of writing. You know, she's a, she's a writer, producer, um, a showrunner on a TV show in, in, in LA. And she's doing amazing, amazing work, you know, and she's, right now in production on one of her new TV shows is called Rother Rutherford Falls. It's going to be on the Peacock um, TV channel. Um, I'm not really sure. I think it's probably going to, they're, they're filming it now. And, and she's doing, she's, do, you know, doing some trailblazing stuff um, on her own. And she's created this show where it's about native people and she has real native people on the show and she has native writers on the show. And, you know, our grandfather, great grandfather came from Canyon de Chez. And when they came back from Bosco Redondo, he, they gave him the, the last name Teller because he was a storyteller. And I told my daughter that, and she, cause sometimes she says, I wish I could keep weaving like, you know, you and Michael. And I tell her, but you weave with your words. You know, that's our history too. Your stories and your, your writing is our history. That comes from your grandparents, from, from Chen Li or Canyon de Chez, you know. So you're keeping up that tradition. You were blessed by the writer's guy, gods, you know. And, um, and so I'm, I'm both very, very proud of them. They're both award-winning weavers and they both beat me a few times during shows and you know where they they win blue ribbons and I win second or third place and which is you know great for me because I'm really really happy that they do that and Michael really took on the the um, the art of weaving and he's been making small pieces big pieces and he's been really you know sometimes he designs his weavings on a computer and it, but you know, and I keep telling him that it looks good on the computer, but it might not come out exactly on, on the weaving, you know, because you just never know. And I love the, the, the weaving that's on the bottom to the, to the left. And because people look at it and they're like, they don't, they see different things, you know, and, and, and some people say that they see a sheep. And then some people say they see the tongue of the Rolling Stone um, album. <laughs> and, and then when you hang it another way, you see something else, you know, and stuff. And, and then the one in, you know, the, the middle with the lines. And he calls those his Iron Man rugs. And he's, he gets inspired by, you know, his comic books and, his, and, and, and different, different things. And it's really fun to watch him become his own you know, and be, just create his, his own um, style. And I really, and he's also an award-winning um, uh, weaver and they both my daughter and, and my, my son, Michael, 
have um, some of their pieces in, um, in museums. So I feel like, you know, I have all these awards and all these accolades and all the stuff, but I think my greatest accomplishment is teaching my two children how to weave. Okay. All right. So, and our seventh generation are our grandkids. Uh, our older sister, Roseanne, um, had two, uh, three sons, and the middle son is, uh, has a daughter uh, named Roxanne Rosalie. She's an award-winning weaver. She is 19. She is in the Navy right now. Um, and as soon as she gets out of the Navy, she's been talking about taking a loom to wherever she's going to be stationed. Um, and she realizes the importance of keeping up this tradition as well. And then we have a new addition to our family, um, little Javier. He is now four years old and he already has a loom. He already has a comb and he runs over and he does a, a few little pat downs and then he's done for the day. So, you know, he's going to get more tasks as he ages, but uh, definitely everybody in our family knows how to weave. And if they don't know how to weave, they are doing something else that is related to weaving, uh, loom building, tools, that kind of stuff. So we are running a little bit short on time. So I'm going to skip a whole bunch of slides, but I, I realize that th this will be loaded onto Facebook and also to the museum's website. And if you have questions on, 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 on the slides that I'm going to skip, please just let us know what, you, uh, what your questions are and we'll answer. But I'm going to skip all the way down. Um, uh, but just, oh. just, just show the pictures. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll show the pictures. But uh, uh, we're, we're just going to have to skip a, a lot of this because we're running out of time. But we usually talk about what the Navajo weaving history is, how we got impacted by the slave trade, on um, how the Navajos got rounded up and sent to Bosco Redondo and imprisoned there for about five years. And then upon our return back, how all the trading posts that popped up, like there were over 271 of them. And then what the elders refer to the second long walk is the livestock production where weavers lost um, uh, all the sheep. Um, and they had to rebuy their uh, wool and stuff from, um, from mills. And then of course the government schools uh, really did, um, um, it created some distance between people and uh, our people and their culture, their arts, uh, the language, everything was impacted. And, um, but Barbara and I are committed to going back and, and when we do our weaving classes, especially for Navajo people, we really like to talk about the history part. And we talk about the, the weaver's path that we put into our two grays. Um, we, we really emphasize the fact that there are other people that um, are, are precious to us. And those are our tool makers, our loom makers. And for us, it's my husband, Belvin. And for a while, um, our, our nephew, uh, Terry Lee, who, uh, who we recently lost in April, um, he, he had taken on that task for a long time. And so we hope that um, his legacy will, will live on through the, the new designs that he had given us, um, the new materials, that, that the, the wood materials that he used, which was way different than just the normal stuff that everybody uses. And he was also a left-handed artist. And so he created tools for left-handed we left weavers as well. And he really, um, he would come to our classes and as people had uh, limitations in their weaving, if they have physical limitations, he always made it a point to create tools for them to uh, weave better or, um, or that they could, um, um, you know, make their work easier. And he, he was really good about that. And we're, we're certainly going to miss him. And at the beginning, when I talked about um, our grandmother's uh, colored weaving, it's this one on the, on the left. There's turquoise in it, and uh, there's some yellow in there. And um, for a period of 11 years, Two Gray Hills used to use color. 
under the traitor uh, Willard Layton. And Willard Layton died in 1959, and the new traitor that was assigned by his widow wanted to go back to the natural colors. And so that was a directive for all of the Two Great Hill Weavers not to use color anymore. But the same technique that uh, our, our ancestors um, that have woven um, is still the same with what we do today. This is a rug from 1996 or 1990 that our older sister Roseanne did. And the same technique is different. It's just that designs have, uh, have um, uh, evolved a little bit into the, the double diamonds and the, uh, the border and the borders inset with other borders. And so, you know, no matter how our looms look, um, we have modern tools. We have a lot of things that my husband, Belvin Pete, who is a mechanical engineer, he has tested a lot of stuff with us to advance our weaving. But the technique that we use is still the same. It doesn't matter what our looms look like. We get criticized a lot because we don't use ropes and we don't, uh, we don't use a lot of the um, um, things that people consider traditional. And we say, you know what? We stay true to how the weaving's done. You know, we embrace modern innovation technology because it makes our work um, go much faster and more accurate. And so our, but our pieces are still true to the old style. And Barbara and I have taken on weaving classes. We've, we've uh, done that now for uh, 20 some odd years. And that has led us to doing books. And so the books that are out today, um, the first book is the Navajo textile book, which is based on the crane collection from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science here in Denver, Colorado. The, the first book that we uh, worked on together was through Thrums Publishing, uh, Spider Woman's Children. And this is a connection that Barbara made when she was the ambassador, the unofficial ambassador of Navajo Weavey. She was sent all over the world um, to do cultural exchange. So she's been to uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Peru, and actually in Peru is where she met uh, uh, Linda Legan, who is uh, the owner of Thrums Publishing, and uh, they, um, uh, uh, Linda and her team, uh, talked to Barbara about uh, doing a book um, on Navajo weavers. And so Barbara uh, mentioned me um, and said that uh, uh, she wanted me to be part of the project. And so this is what we did. It was a really um, a great time to focus on Navajo weavers. And we chose some elders, we chose some mid-career, we chose some young weavers, and we chose some male weavers. And we went to their homes, we interviewed them. And these are stories that we share with everyone about how people work, how, um, how people still are connected to their weaving through uh, stories and through the tools that they use. Um, and we're very proud of that book. And we just uh, really like Thrums Publishing finally giving us a voice to do our own books because from the time of Conquistador and Colonial Contact, this is the first book, Spider Woman's Children is the first book that has ever been written by Navajo Weavers about Navajo Weavers. And you think about that, and that's pretty incredible that we finally have a voice. We finally get to tell our own stories our way without having a lot of explanations or assumptions. And that was one of the things that we didn't like about uh, some of the books that have been out there since the 1920s. Um, our newest book is How to Weave a Navajo Rug. And again, this is through Thrums Publishing. And uh, they kind of gave us free reign on how we um, do our lessons. And um, we're, so, we're so proud of it because Barbara and I finally got a chance to um, uh, focus on photos, on illustrations. And our illustrations were made by uh, Michael Yellowman, who is Navajo. And he lives here in the Denver area as well. Um, we had a whole Navajo team. Um, but we also did use uh, Thrum's uh, photographer, Joe Coco, um, and we used some of his, his um, 
um, uh, photos to, uh, from Canyon de Chez and from, from our trips all across Navajo land. And um, we really hope that this is a book that will be uh, used for beginners. Um, and we try to give you some information about where to get your supplies from. Um, we're already getting a lot of um, uh, hits on our website, um, people wanting to buy looms, people wanting to buy tools. And you know, we put a supply list in there and we also put in some of the tool makers so you can contact them directly on, on you know, if you wanna buy a rug or, or if you wanna buy a, uh, a loom. We also highlighted some weavers and uh, and this and we didn't have a lot of room to include a lot of their information and their photos. So you'll see um, the weaver's name and uh, their email address. So hopefully some of those weavers will get some hits on selling their pieces. And one of the things that people are really afraid of is like how to ask how much is that rug. Um, you know, they, people don't know that uh, you can actually commission a rug and it sounds really expensive, but it's really not because it's a time pay and it really helps with people's budget, especially now in this time frame when we're all impacted by uh, COVID and all the other stuff going on. Um, and so, you know, Barbara and I have been really blessed with um, uh, us doing our, our, our life's work. Um, and staying true to what our grandmothers have taught us, what our mom taught us, what we learned from our older sister. And we're even learning from our younger generation. You know, I've learned a lot from my niece, Sierra, from my nephew, Michael, and our granddaughter, uh, Roxanne. And I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from, uh, from little Javier because they are seeing a different world, but we're all connected by our weaving. Uh, Barbara and I um, are very committed to making sure that the, our future generation are going to continue to do weaving, regardless of, of what path they take. You know, they're always going to be bound by our weaving. And that's our presentation today. Thank you so much. Thank and, you very much. Well, yeah, this has so, been so fantastic. We have, we have some questions. Sure. Okay. Uh, first of all, someone asked, they'd love to hear a little bit of history. I think, Melissa, we have a few minutes. That um, maybe. Oh, okay. Okay, well, uh, you know, when the Navajos started weaving, and uh, there's been a lot of information that um, ethnographers and the early on uh, anthropologists um, have made a lot of assumptions about where Navajo weaving came from. And a lot of times people will say, you know, Navajos learn how to weave from the Spanish or the Pueblos. Well, the Pueblos were weaving. They were weaving with cotton. Um, Navajo people started out weaving with cotton and they were weaving shoes, they were weaving functional um, uh, uh, clothing, blankets, that kind of stuff. And, um, and I think that in those days there, was a, there were a lot of trading and anytime you go to a trading area and even to this day, if you go to a shopping mall, you are there viewing all the goods that have been made by other countries, that have been made by um, signature artists, and that's where people get ideas from. And so I really think that those trading market days is where Navajo people, um, we already knew how to weave from, you know, uh, weaving functional pieces, but they adapted to what they saw, you know, adapting the, the Pueblo style looms, that kind of stuff. And so um, we, we are trying to, um, uh, not not correct history, but also give our side because we never had a voice before. We never had the chance to really say where our weaving came from. You know, our weaving has been dictated by our healing ceremonies. You know, we have, um, we adhere to uh, uh, the, the rules. They're not really rules, but they're, they're, um, uh, 
things that we live by, I think, by the beauty way, which is one of the healing ceremonies. And they have a lot of lessons for weaving rugs, for weaving baskets, for pottery, for all the arts that the Navajo people do. And um, so the history part, you know, uh, once we got recognized for the tight weave um, and we got round, you know, the Navajo people got rounded up in 1863 to 1868, they were in Bosco Redondo and weaving still happened there. The uh, Indian agents, the, the, uh, the army, they brought in uh, uh, um, blankets from uh, India and from England that the Navajo people traded for and they, re, uh, they, they unraveled a lot of the, the, uh, the products and they respun it or recarded it and made rugs from it. And that's what they um, uh, traded for, maybe additional food or, or rations or whatever. And a lot of those pieces ended up on the East Coast because that's where the army people came from. And, and that's where a lot of the uh, Antiques Roadshow, um, you, know, you know, people find these old pieces in their attics. And uh, they were brought over by the officers or whomever had taken them back East. And, um, and then also during that same period, there was a slave period to where Navajo weavers and their children were targeted. And in the Santa Fe Plaza area is where they were auctioned off for uh, Mexican households and for Spanish households. And the dresses that my, my sister and I are wearing in this photo was made specifically um, to combat the, the slave period because when Navajo weavers got uh, uh, taken as slaves, the, the dresses that they wore were dark so that they could escape in the night. Um, they would be cam camouflage. And on their dresses, you'll notice that there are four bands that are woven. And that's to remind the wearer that even if they were taken as a slave, that they have a responsibility to, to try to escape and go home within the four sacred mountains. And uh, the dress that Barbara's wearing, that's a spider woman design because in our family, we regard her as spider woman. Um, and I have the lightning design because I'm the one that does the most talking, <laughs> as <laughs> my sister say. Um, and so, you know, the, the history is really important. And when, when we came back from Bosco Redondo, the 271 trading posts that went up, every single one of those dealt with Navajo weavers. They either championed weavers, most of the time they exploited weavers. And it wasn't until 1973 that the FCC came in and uh, really put a stop to the pawn and to the high interest rates that weavers were experiencing. And that's why to this day, there's less than 10 viable trading posts that are doing business because it was, it, you know, everybody um, uh, realized what the Navajos could do and they made a profit off of us. And so to this day, Barbara and I, um, we don't use middlemen. We don't uh, sell our stuff to trading posts or galleries. We market all our own pieces. And so when we teach classes and we are mentoring young weavers, we try to uh, make marketing part of the whole experience. So that's just a little piece of history. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing. We have another question that, um, what makes say two gray hills weaving? What are the characteristics? And you had talked about that, but maybe you could just circle back. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so both of these are considered two gray hill weavings. Um, the one on the right was, was probably done in the early 50s. It has color, um, but it also has the double diamonds. It's got the four corner pieces and it's got the center pieces. So if you look over to the right, the, the design elements are still there. Um, although this one is all natural color uh, from the sheep. And in Two Gray Hills, we cross card um, some colors. Like you take a little bit of black, you add a little bit of white, you, you card it, and you get different shades of gray. You can get different shades of brown. You can get different shades of tan just by cross blending all your colors. And that's a really uh, a highly skilled um, activity that uh, 
if you don't do it correctly, you get a lot of striations in your weaving and it detracts from, from the beauty of the piece. So, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do for two grays uh, requires skill, skill in spinning, skill in carding and skill in weaving. Um, and, and in two gray hill area, there are the, the rugs are the tapestries from there are probably the most expensive because we do still do a lot of handwork ourselves. We don't do any dyeing. We don't do any natural dyeing. Um, the black is enhanced with aniline dye because most black sheep it has reddish tones and the white is whitened with gypsum clay. So we try to do, um, and uh, aniline dye is coal tar based. So it's still considered a natural product. Um, we try not to use acid dye, um, but you know, those are the only two things that, that we uh, altered the color, the, uh, the black and white, but the rest of the colors, they're all cross carded. And in Two Bay Hills, we have the borders. So we always put in uh, a weaver's path. And that has kind of taken on a life of its own because of all the explanations by anthropologists, by gallery owners, by trading post people. You know, they, they, they have stories because they want to sell rugs. Uh, but for us, it takes on a whole different meaning where our, um, our um, uh, weaver's path is that little line that you see that goes out to the end of the, the weaving. And that path is to honor Spider Woman because that's her web leading out. That's our web. We're Spider Woman. We, we wove this and our web uh, goes to the next rug. I have my mom's last weaving. She before she stopped weaving, she made a weaving for all of us kids. And I have the last one because I'm the last one in the family. And she didn't put her line in it. And her web stopped there. So when she gave me the rug, she said, this is my last piece. And my, my web isn't there. And so it's, it's uh, for us, it's a different meaning than what you read about in the books that are written by non-Navajos. Is that the same thing as a spirit line? That's what they call it. And we don't yeah. call it that. We call it a weaver's path. Again, a lot of the stories have been enhanced or altered by um, uh, non-Navajos. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the traders, it's, it's, a, it's a marketing ploy. You know, and, and then, like if they have... Um, if they happen to have a mistake with the designs and stuff, they'll just make up a story to go with the, with the piece, you know, and it sounds very good. And I think that's probably why they started calling the, the, the Weaver's Path. In Navajo, we call it Jin Team, but, um, but they call it Spirit Line because, you know, that's, and then they say, it's for good and bad spirits to come and go and keeps harmony in the rug. And, you know, that sounds really good, but, you know, and, and it's a marketing ploy, and for, but for us, it has a deeper meaning. Very good. Uh, another question that's been asked is, why can't you get raw wool? Is that because of the pandemic? Or? Well, no, we, we oh. live in the city. I live in Denver. I live in Denver proper. Uh, my sister lives in Tucson proper. We can't have sheep. I mean, just uh, <laughs> our, our uh, neighborhood just recently passed a uh, uh, an ordinance to have nine live chickens. I mean, but there's no sheep. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, weavers on the Navajo Nation that raise their own sheep. Uh, a lot of them do churro. We don't use churro because for us, uh, we, we strive for the fineness um, we, we have, we do tapestry quality and you can't get that with churro because it's too rough. Um, we can't spin it that fine. So we use a, a Merino breed of, of, uh, uh, wool that we get from the mills and, uh, a lot of the different breeds of sheep that we have, uh, Barbadino, like Coopsworth, we do Lincoln, we do, uh, yeah, um, Cordale, Rambouillet, uh, Moreno. Um, Cordell. I think Cordell is probably my favorite to work with. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really amazing because, you know, growing up, you just looked at wool as wool, you know, and I never knew that there were different breeds and they had different names. You know, it wasn't until 
both our aunts um, lost their flocks. They sold all their flocks because they're they're elderly now, so they can't take care of the the sheep. And and Lynn and I started looking for wool to, to work with, and that's when I realized that there are diff there are differences between the, the fibers. You know, some fibers are very soft. Some fibers are very um, kinky. Some fibers are very um, hard to work with. And so we kind of go through all this and figure out which ones we like to work with. And, um, and it's much nicer to, um, to work with the finer, finer um, and the softer wool because it's easier to spin. And then we also kind of eliminated, because we're doing that, we kind of eliminated the carding part you know, because most of the the, uh, the 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 wool that we buy is already in um, uh, roving wool, and it's 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 um, it comes off really really nice um, when you spin it. So excellent! Well, this has been just amazing. I thank you personally, and. Um, Someone commented that they grew up in New Mexico and they didn't know any of this history. Oh. So that, that was a nice <laughs> comment. I'm going to turn this back over to Melissa and she's going to do a wrap up. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Ladies, again, I just want to echo Judy's thanks. Thank you so much for taking the time today. We had a lot of people that have Said how much they appreciated it. There were a couple of comments about how gorgeous the rug, um, the uh, big rug that you were talking about is. Um, so thank you so much again for sharing this. Um, thank you everyone who tuned in today. Um, their information is up on the screen right now. Um, their website is actually posted on the museum's website as well. That's the Navajo rugweavers.com. And the museum will be doing another one of these on October 16th um, with a couple of other artists. So we invite you to do that, uh, to join us again for those. Again, these Friday programs with the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts are free. Any donations are appreciated. Um, the museum's website is wiquiltmuseum.com. You can click right on the homepage. It'll uh, take you to a donations page. But again, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Linda, so much for sharing this and sharing so much of your family heritage and history with us, too. Thank you. And definitely. Yeah. This, is, and this is our book. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> so for those Goodbye. of you. It, went, oh, it yeah. came out yesterday. So yesterday, bye, bye, bye. and you can get it on Amazon. Yes. And yes. through to Thrums Books. Yeah. Yep. Thrums Books. How do you spell thrums? T H R U M S. Okay. Thrums. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and then our photos. <laughs> we look forward to checking and, it out. And just right, to remind, if you. there's anything that you missed watching today, um, give us just a little bit of time. We will be posting this to the museum's YouTube page or else you can go back to Facebook and you can rewatch it as many times as you want. Um, I know I definitely want to go back and look at some of the, the artwork and look at it a little bit more in depth um, of some of the things that you, you shared with us today. So again, thank you ladies very much. Sure, yeah, and Barbara, and, Barbara and I both have uh, Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if anybody wants to ask us questions, you can access on, on Facebook or mm -hmm. you can uh, write to us at our website and uh, yeah, and so we, we answer, we try to answer all questions, um, but Barbara and I are, are going to start doing online classes, and we hope to get that kicked off probably in November. Right now, we're going through some edits that we're going to do a series of uh, video clips that's also going to follow uh, the book and the instructions in here. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get that off the ground and offer it for beginners and then we're going to do another section for uh warping and another section for uh advanced weavers if they want to get into like more elaborate designs and things like that so we we, we have a lot of stuff just kind of you know happening yeah fantastic okay. thank you mm -hmm.